Hello, good morning students. So again, today we will continue with our law of torts. So far we have learned about liability and trespass. So today we will move a little bit further and go and check what are the other miscellaneous torts or what are the other examples of torts or what are the other kind of civil wrongs. And the question whether even animals when they commit trespass. Now the question is, who is liable when animals commit trespass? So that's an interesting topic for today. And apart from that, we are going to also learn about strict liability. Uh, and in that there is a landmark judgment, which you must, you must, and you must remember throughout your life. That is Rylance versus Fletcher. And this was actually a prominent and a landmark, or even you could call it as a classic case, which actually put forth the concept of strict liability and emphasized on strict liability. That is when, uh, or it set down instances um, about how and when liability has to be applied in all circumstances in a very strict manner and in an absolute way. So therefore, Rylance versus Fletcher set forth strict and absolute liability as a theory in this particular case. Now, apart from that, we are going to learn, of course, as an animal trespass and so on. So let's go to our slides directly. Okay. Now, again, one another example of tort or a civil wrong or yet another prominent tort apart from negligence is nuisance. Now, the simple meaning of the word nuisance is to annoy. You must have heard someone just saying, oh, this person is a nuisance, or this area is a nuisance, or it is a nuisance, So such kind of expressions you must have heard. Now, what is nuisance in the legal sense? Even in the legal sense, it is connected to the normal um, English word nuisance, which means to annoy. And it is derived from a French word neur, which means to hurt or to annoy. And also the Latin word nocer, which means to reason harm or to annoy, to annoy a person or to create disturbance to a person to the extent that it affects the, the normal peaceful, uh, you know, existence of a person or normal, uh, you know, enjoyment of normal, peaceful living of a person. So anything which disturbs the mind of a person or peace of a person or tranquility of a person would amount to annoyance. So annoyance, causing annoyance to someone, causing nuisance to someone is also a civil wrong. For example, playing loud music, like also playing loud music beyond 10 p.m. at night. So all this, or you know, or constantly making noise, or constant fights or bickering in the neighborhood. So all this is nuisance. Now, nuisance simply means again reiterating, causing annoyance to the extent of depriving a party or individual of his or her basic right of enjoying peace. We all understand and we note up till now that living peacefully is a basic right. Enjoying normal, peaceful life is a basic human right. Now, anything that takes away that basic right of living peacefully or enjoying peace and tranquility and annoying someone would amount to a civil wrong or the wrong or a thought. 
So nuisance may be an act or an omission on the part of a tort visa that causes annoyance or disturbance to a person, individual or family, or even a locality for that purpose. For example, playing loud music beyond 10 p.m., as I said earlier. So nuisance is a tort. It may be, again, a private wrong or a public wrong. I'm reiterating, nuisance can be either a private wrong or a public wrong. Now, what is public wrong or what is public nuisance? Public nuisance, as a term implies, refers to nuisance to a group of people or community more effectively to the public at large, where a larger number of people are affected or the public or a group of people or community at large, when it affects the community at large, it is called as public nuisance or it involves also a natural omission which interferes with the comfort, health, safety, peace, and tranquility of the locality or public. Now, creating public nuisance attracts even penal provisions of the land, that is criminal laws of the land in most jurisdictions. I mean, in most parts of the world, in most countries, creating public nuisance attracts criminal laws of the land or penal provisions of the land. That means it is a criminal offense again, and it is actionable per se. That means on the face of it, when nuisance is committed, it is actionable. I mean, they can file a, you know, a case, a charge can be placed against a person. It is actionable per se. The rationale or the reasoning behind making public nuisance a criminal offense or punishable under criminal laws is to discourage any activity that hampers the peace and tranquility of the public at large with the intention of maintaining peace within the territory. So what is the purpose or why is nuisance uh, you know, considered as a criminal offense? It, it simply means, it, it is simply because, uh, you know, so as to not to cause or endanger the peace and tranquility in a society. So not to endanger the, you know, the peaceful living in a particular society or a community. So now that is again with the intention of maintaining peace or within the territory. So the contrasting feature again, as against private nuisance, is that it appears to have been committed when it inflicts injury or causes harm to an individual or a family by way of illegal or unauthorized interference with the rights of another person. So public nuisance normally is a nuisance where it hampers the peace and tranquility or annoys a larger group of people or a community at large or a society at large. Whereas, like for example, you know, uh, like without municipal permissions or without the local, uh, uh, you know, regulations being abided by or without local permissions, you know, somebody organizes uh, or, you know, a kind of, say, for example, a street show a street show uh, with loud music and it goes on from you know morning to evening so when this happens so you know the 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 local officials can come and put a stop at that so it, it would amount to public nuisance however if the person has taken permission to carry on that particular activity or you know uh, you know whatever activity it is or even it is an entertainment show for example so, I mean, after obtaining valid licenses or permissions, it may be allowed. However, without obtaining valid license or permission, it would, it would be regarded as a nuisance. However, private nuisance is where a, an individual is affected or a private party is affected or, you know, or just even, a, you know, a family is affected. For example, you have a neighbor who is very noisy and is playing loud music or having parties at midnight and the, 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 the noise of the party is so much that it you know it doesn't allow you to sleep and it goes on throughout the night and it is a regular feature not just once in a way it, it has to be a regular feature so that would be private nuisance now to constitute a tort or a civil wrong or private nuisance three factors must be proved one is an act or commission or omission that causes harm or damage or physical or mental discomfort of some form to an individual or private party or family or unreasonable unauthorized interference with legitimate rights of the private party and this unauthorized interference must be maybe tangible or intangible or palpable or not palpable so it's 
obviously there has to be an act of commission or omission and it has to involve an unreasonable or unauthorized interference with the legal rights of a private party with the legitimate rights of private party and it must be something that can be easily seen felt experienced so tangible or it can be also intangible that cannot be touched probably tangible is something which you can feel and touch intangible something which you cannot feel and touch so next is what is the remedies remedies for a nuisance is that abatement that is to stop the action or to reduce the action or remove the factor of nuisance that which is creating nuisance injunction is to bring a stop order or to you know to bring a restraining order or to stop the activity of specific activity it may be you know permanent injunction temporary injunction or simply restraining orders or just preliminary or interlocutory in injunction that is something in between on the other hand yet another remedy just as in the other talks is of course damages can be claimed compensation can be claimed now what are the defenses for the defendant now someone files the plaintiff files a suit against a party who now who becomes a defendant in a case now what is the defense of the 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 defendant now so there are two defenses that he can take one is acting under statutory authority of course one would be you know he's acting under the law second is again under that you could also say that he has obtained relevant permission so there are two angles to this or you can bifurcate this into uh, bifurcate it into one where he or she or the party is acting under uh, you know relevant authority or he's a government official or under the law he's performing under the law two the other part of it where the party is has uh, you know obtained relevant licenses for a party, for creating some noise for example like as i said earlier you you obtain license and permission under the relevant laws and you carry on a particular activity next is prescriptive rights prescriptive rights again easementry rights comes under easementry rights where the party has got the the right because he has been or he uh, you know the party has been carrying on this activity for several years for example um um say now there is a grinding mill in a locality and the grinding mill is you know for years together in beside the grinding mill there are you know human the other settlements or you know some kind of uh, uh, you know flat systems which have come up beside it there is a grinding mill here and so the sound of the grinding mill you know it disturbs the locality so then someone comes up and says who shifted newly says no no this grinding mill is creating a lot of nuisance and doesn't allow us to sleep so the part the you know the grinding mill owner can claim prescriptive right this is just an example for you. Now let's move on to the concept of strict liability, which was laid down in Rylands versus Fletcher. Rylands versus Fletcher was an 1868 English case that was a progenitor of the doctrine of strict liability for abnormally dangerous condition and activities. So strict liability occurs where the tortfeasor or the defendant has caused damage as a direct proximate result of his act or mission, which act or omission may or may not be construed as negligent. So the factor of damage caused as a result of a wrongful act or omission attracts the principle of strict liability where the defendant will be directly held liable for the tort and damages would be awarded. Now, strict liability, again, for the purpose of study, we can bifurcate it as laid down in violence versus Fletcher case, as well as liability for animals owned that we will see uh, during the later part of this class. So basically strict liability occurs when, where the tortfeasor or the defendant has caused some damage as a direct result of his act. So something that he has performed directly is directly responsible. There is a proximate, uh, you know, uh, uh, proximate, um, you, know, uh, you know, reasoning between the act as well as the damage that is caused, that is a causation, that is, a, he's directly involved, he is the cause of the damage. And in every probability and in every angle, he is he's not expected to do that, and it has happened, and it has caused some damage. So then the factor of damage that is caused as a result of the wrongful act of the an omission attracts the principle of strict liability. Now let us see the facts of Rylands versus Fletcher just to make things clear. Wow. 
Again, this is creating problems. Um, I'll have to stop sharing this and use the other mode. Okay, so what are the facts in Rylands versus Fletcher? Now, just in brief, now here the defendant got some contractors to construct a reservoir on his land. Due to the negligence of the contractors, water leaked from the reservoir to the plaintiff's coal mine located below the land, thus causing extensive damage to the coal mine. Now, the conduct of the defendant didn't appear to come within the scope of an existing tort. However, the rule of strict liability was propounded and explicated or explained in this case. Now, what happened in this case was there was a person and he constructed some reservoirs on his land. Now, there was another coal mine just near that land. And because of this construction, there was some water leakage from this reservoir to the plaintiff's coal mine. So the question was whether the defendant was liable because he, he carried on an activity in his land. So the question was, the coal mine was damaged so whether the defendant is liable at all. Now, in this case, they applied or came up with the concept of strict liability, where Justice Blackburn opined that the person who for his own purpose brings on his land and collects or and keeps anything there, which is likely to do mischief, or if it escapes, it must, you know, or must keep it at his own peril there. And if he does not do so is prima facie answerable for all the damages, which is the neutral consequence of its escape. So what Justice Blackburn said that a person has to be careful enough to bring anything on the land and whatever he does, he should be aware whether or not it causes any mischief or whether or not it escapes. And in case he knows that it is going to escape, he does it so at his own peril and is also answerable for all the damages, which is a natural consequence of its escape. Now, what are the principal elements that were deduced in this case? The elements that need to be established for strict liability in the land case are one, there must be an escape. That means there has to be something which just escapes or just goes out and causes damage. This escape should be something that is unnaturally brought on the land. The thing must be a non-natural use of the land. So the rule of strict liability is established in Ryland versus Fledger. It applies to anything which is likely to escape. For example, escape of noxious gas from industries. Now, therefore, this encompasses or includes which are further includes things which are further and beyond that are inherently dangerous like gas petrol chemicals and so on so it also includes harmless things like water which could become dangerous if 
it escapes or it is accumulated in quantities large enough to do mischief or large enough to escape. So therefore, the three factors that must be present in strict liability is that there must be an escape. The escape should be something that is unnaturally brought to the land and the thing must be a non-natural use of the land. It is something that is not required to be a part of that land. So that is strict liability. So three elements must be proved in strict liability. Next is what are the defenses to the rule of strict liability? One is the consent of the plaintiff. That is, that is a general defense in the law of torts, which is, yeah. of course, embodied in the maxim of voluntary non-fit injuria, if you remember, where oh. the plaintiff, in case he directly or indirectly consents to the particular, you know, activity, and then it causes mischief, and then it escapes, you know, then he or she cannot complain about any ensuing damage. Next is default of the plaintiff, where he does not do anything on his part to avoid the mis to avoid the problem or to avoid the damage that was in a situation in which damage suffered was a result of the plaintiff's own default then again this is not applicable next is again act of god act of god is a situation which is beyond human control like for example natural disaster like flood storm earthquake and then the act of a stranger act of a stranger in the sense where there was someone else who has done it and the plaintiff was you know, either remotely connected or not at all connected, and it was not he basically into the picture or remotely connected. So these are the four defenses for strict liability where the defendant can say, well, it was with the consent of the plaintiff, two, it was actually the default of the plaintiff, or three, it is the act of God. It is beyond human, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is beyond human, um, uh, you know, activity, or it is something beyond, uh, you know, something that can be, controlled by a human being or beyond human control or an act of a stranger that is where the plaintiff, where the defendant is not connected in the case at all. Next is sort of animal or trespass. This is something interesting. So the question is when an animal trespasses into someone's land, who is held responsible? So in the law of thought, it would be the keeper or the owner of the animal. For example, I've given you is the cattle belonging to Mr. X gets mad and rushes into the fields of Mr. Y, crushing the crops of the field. So who is liable here? So Mr. X get, is liable for the destruction that is caused on Y's field. Now, in the case of Manton versus Brockle Bank, this is a 1923 King's Bench case, it was held that it is the person who has interest in the land that can sue under cattle trespass. There's yet another case that is Hudson versus Robert and the citation is not available. So the plaintiff here was gored. That means he was attacked to the extent that he was bleeding by the defendant's bull because uh, you know, he was wearing a red handkerchief uh, around his neck. So the defendant, so then the bull attacked him. So the defendant was able to prove that in this case, the plaintiff knew of the vicious tendency. So the question here is about vicious tendency, uh, which we will discuss in the subsequent slides. What is this vicious tendency? That means the keeper or the owner of the animal knows that the animal may behave in a vicious manner. That is abnormally, vicious or a gruesome manner, abnormally. See, something which is within the natural instinct that is, which is natural for the animal to do. So the keeper would not be held responsible in case of domestic pets. However, if the domestic pet is unusually and abnormally violent and he knows that the pet gets abnormally violent, that means something is, the, the, the pet is sick or is you know mentally sick, you know, its brain is not functioning normally. So if it has a vicious tendency, that means the keeper would be held responsible or the owner would be held responsible. Hence, in this case, the defendant was held responsible. Thereby, the liability arises depending upon the type of animal on one hand, that is whether it is a domestic animal or a wild animal and the facts and circumstances of each case. Next is, Liability for animals under the law of thoughts is classified into two. One is scienta action, that is liability for dangerous animals or wild animals. Under that, it's animals' fair nature and animals' mansuta nature. Now, we'll first finish that. 
Animals fed in nature means or dangerous animals which are ferocious in nature, such as lions, tigers, and in all probability can cause harm to others when it is let free. Even if some wild animals are tamed, but then end up causing harm to another, that means a keeper of the animal will be held responsible for the damage. Next is um, animals mensut naturally. That means this is categorically tame animals. However, the factor of, uh, you know, natural animal instinct and vicious instinct would be taken into consideration. Now, if a tamed pet or a household pet has a vicious tendency to harm, that means a keeper or the owner of the animal, you know, he will be held responsible for any damage that may be inflicted. And the plaintiff must prove the fact that the animal has vicious propensity or a tendency and that he was aware of the tendency. Now, as in the case of Hudson versus Robert, where the plaintiff was wearing uh, the red handkerchief, they said that the plaintiff was, uh, you know, very well aware of the vicious tendency and uh, sorry, the defendant was very well aware of the vicious tendency and therefore the plaintiff was entitled to claim damages. Next is in Burkle versus Holmes, the defendant's cat entered into the plaintiff's land and killed 14 of his pet birds. So in this case, defendant was under no liability because they said that the cat was actually acting according to the normal instinct that cats normally have of, you know, of um, eating birds or, you know, killing birds. Next is, what are the defenses? One is again, plaintiff's fault or, or the default example, uh, you know, teasing the animal, throwing stones at the animal, provoking the animal. Next is voluntary non-fit injuria, again, deliberate attempt or interferences that has, you know, kicked in the viciousness of the animal. Next concept is about cattle trespass. Now, cattle trespass arises when cattle, that is, you know, cows, buffaloes, uh, you know, or even goats, fowls are included in the, or hen, in the possession of control of the owner, that is the defendant moves into the, uh, you know, the plaintiff's property and causes damage. So the question is whether, the you know they can you know claim damages so generally a liability would arise normally and the defendant would be liable to pay damages however there are instances where you know where cattle is taken uh, through a particular road and a highway and cattle just strays to the nearby land so certain circumstances the court does not avoid saying that it is natural instinct for a cow or a buffalo, even while it is just being taken by the owner on a, on a particular road, it is just natural for it to stray. So again, it depends upon facts and circumstances of each case. So miscellaneous animal taught, again, for example, if a monkey or a dog is trained to steal or pick items that belong to some other person, now again, who is held responsible? Of course, the owner. And again, it would involve many other factors that the owner has trained the monkey or a dog to steal or, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, a, in the normal course of his, you know, uh, you know, it's just his uh, normal way of using the dog to steal and he himself is the one who is actually stealing it through the dog. So there are a number of factors involved. Next is thereby keeper of animals may be held liable for the harm inflicted or damaged, depending again upon facts and circumstances of each case. It may for the top it now again here it may be again for the thought of trespass that is you know moving into some other property or land uh unauthorized entry or it could be you know negligence or uh, depending upon what is the damage that is caused or even nuisance or some other civil action so this is all about thought of animals and uh nuisance as well as strict liability as in the case of violence versus fletcher Rylance versus Fletcher is a very important case that you must know along with the citation. And the citation is LR3HL330. So this must be there. So what must be known in Rylance versus Fletcher case is, of course, the principle that was laid down, the elements that need to be proved in strict liability, and uh, that, uh, you know, it was Rylance versus Fletcher that came up with a theory of strict liability and then, of course, the facts of the case and what the court held in that particular case. So that's all for this class. If you have any questions, you can ask me. If not, we meet for the next class. Uh, hello, teacher. Uh, let me just take your attendance.
Before yeah, it gets I like to, yeah, I want to ask you one thing. Uh, I think when you okay, have so all point, of you are present. Um, a reminder again about your assignments. Uh, I said if it goes beyond a particular date, negative marking will be applicable. That's one thing. Second, get ready for your exams simultaneously. There are, uh, I think, just another two to three class that is remaining and we will wind up with the law of thoughts as well as even for jurisprudence. Uh, this would be a last class for the morning and we are going to resume normal classes from the, you know, after Ramadan, of course. Thank you and see you on Monday. Bye-bye.